they didn't recognize me, or, or they'd say, hear my name, say, oh, God, you're the guy who writes all those mysteries, you know, murder mysteries. And whenever that happens, I always have to correct them, because what I tell them is that, no, I don't write mysteries, per se. What I'm writing are books about strong, independent women. Some of them commit crimes, some of them solve crimes, but what the, the common thread that runs through each and every one of my books isn't so much murder, because sometimes there aren't murders, rather it's about the fact that all these women are in it. So tonight what I want to tell you about is where all the ideas for all these books managed to come from. Okay? Yeah. Um, I come from a very long line of strong independent women. This is my great-great-grandmother. This is her wedding portrait taken in December 1860. Yes. Yeah. And, um, she grew up in the South. She, she grew up on a farm in Georgia. And sitting right next to her is Riley Brooks. And if you're in the South and it's December 1860, guess what's going to happen in four months? Yeah. The outbreak of the Civil War. Yeah. And Riley Brooks is going to go off to war, and he's going to be dead within a year. But what's going to happen is, is that it's going to leave along my, my great-great-grandmother, Elizabeth Winifred Blackshear, with ultimately two children because she will remarry two years later. But along, in, along in, in November 1864, along comes Sherman. And Sherman is heading from Atlanta down to the sea, if you've ever seen Gone with the Wind. And in the process of all that, he's going to come right through that farm. And so what's going to happen is that Elizabeth is going to gather thing, everything she has in the world, including, including this ambrotype, going to put it into an ox cart along with her two daughters, and they're going to trek north up to, this, up to Augusta, Georgia, where she had family members, and that's together where they're going to group. And so Elizabeth Winifred Blackshear began a history in my family, a piece of family lore that unfortunately, unfortunately, keeps getting repeated itself different, many different ways. Elizabeth's daughter would end up marrying fairly well, marrying an older gentleman, but he would die within 10 years after they were married, leaving her with, it, with two daughters, once again, one age seven and one age four. Those two daughters, which turned out to be my great aunt and my grandmother, and my, and there was also a something in, in the family where typically it was the elder daughter who would get called out and who would be asked to raise the, you know, take care of all of the unmarried people in the family. You're, you're nodding. Does that ever happen in your family too? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And so what happened was, of course, in this case, was that Aunt Hattie, great Aunt Hattie, um, never married. Instead, she took care of the family. And my grandmother would marry, and she would be doing fine. She would marry in 1915. And in December 1918, her husband would go off to work in the morning, and he would come home at noon not feeling well. By night, he would be running a fever of 106, and he would be dead the next morning of influenza. So he was one of the, one of the victims of the pandemic in 1918. And he once again left behind two daughters. In this case, it would be my aunt and my great aunt, who are right over here. That's, that's my mother there on the right, and that's my Aunt Virginia there on the left. And so in the family, once again, my mother being the eldest was going to be called out in order to take care of the rest of the family, because at this point there were now three generations out there living under one roof. But my mother had a plan, and my mother's plan was that she eloped. And she not only eloped, she eloped with a perfectly unsuitable gentleman. He was, in fact, he was, all he was was simply the son of a mill hand guy who fixed looms in one of the textile factories in Augusta. And so when you read the, when you read the uh, announcement for the wedding, the first thing you discover is that none of my mother's family attended the wedding. And the second thing that happened was that they were married in December 1940. And what's going to guess what's going to happen in December 1941? Once again, along is going to come another war. This time my father's going to enlist in the Navy. And if you believe in fairy godmothers, I, I turns out that I do, because my father, instead of being just simply put off, you know, the South Pacific or something like that, you're given a set of aptitude tests, and he took the aptitude test, and it said he was a good mechanic. And so they sent him off to teach, to teach him how to go ahead and fix airplane engines. And then when the time came for him to be assigned in, in 1942 out to a place, you know, where he was going to be stationed, they gave him the choice that he was going, he was going to be he was going to be fixing the planes that were part of the submarine hunter fleet that was, that was in the Caribbean. And they gave him a choice. You could either be based out of wicked New York, or you could be based out of Miami. And so he went off, and, he, and my mother and they moved to Miami in 1942. They had a daughter, 
Beverly, one in 1943. I came along in 1949. And it seemed like this was gonna be a pretty good thing going on because this is my father, him. Turns out to be a very good guy after all. But in my family, these things never run smoothly because what happened was in 1955, he was diagnosed with cancer. And in 1950s, you didn't go out and you didn't get it cured. There were no cures for it. It was simply, it was a death sentence. It was a question how long it was going to take. And he died in 1958, a few months after my, a few months after my, uh, not, excuse me, November 1957, a few months after my eighth birthday. When that happened, that set in motion a couple of wheels that are kind of interesting because my mother was told all is forgiven. All you have to do is simply come home and take care of us and everything will be fine because of what had happened was my Aunt Virginia had been called out for that, much to her surprise. And my mother had her own ideas. She enjoyed living in Florida. She enjoyed being independent. And so instead, she set up a negotiation. And the negotiation turned out to be me. The reason I know all of this lore is because starting in 1958 and continuing every year until I was 14 years old, I would get put in one of the Silver Sides Greyhound buses in Miami with two bologna sandwich and a thermos of iced tea, told by the change in Jacksonville, and then I would end up that evening in Augusta, Georgia, where I would spend the summer with my great aunt, my grandmother, and my aunt. And they taught me all of the lore that went along with the family. And, they, and it's the reason why the things like the amber types and the quilts that go along with them all end up getting passed down to me because I'm the person who appreciated all of it. But one thing that I never know, never got to find out is whether or not I was intended to go into the arts or anything like that, or intended to be a writer or something like that. I know my mother pushed me in that direction. This is, this is me in arsenic and old lace there, you know, strangling Jonathan Brewster. This is me right there, number two in the line, and dance thing. I have no memory of it is, but I, I do see that. And I'm way back here at the back of a choral selection in there back in the first grade or something like that. My mother really wanted me to do things like that, but I also had different ideas. I went off into business. Went out, got myself a degree, and, and went off into the corporate world. And there I went for the next 35 years. Ended up doing very well in it. I was doing absolutely fine. But in 19, excuse me, just it was last week in 2005 that I had the opportunity to walk away from all that without worrying about where my next paycheck was going to be coming from. And I did not hesitate for even a second to do that. And there was a reason. I had always wanted to write. So when the time came on that date, I went home and I told my wife, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to go back to school tomorrow because I had a couple of offers on the table and I didn't want to take them. I was burned out. And she said, I have, our, I have read our wedding vows very, very carefully. It mentions better or poor, richer or health. It says nothing about marrying you for lunch. So what are you going to do with yourself? And I said, I wanted to write. She says, okay, you get six months. And at the end of six months, you do not have yourself a manuscript and an agent. You go back to work because I do not want you underfoot. Well, what happened was, six months later, I had a manuscript, and I had, a, and I had an agent, and I had an idea for a book called Murder Imperfect. And where does an idea for a book come? There has to be sort of an aha moment. How many of you have ever been to a charity dinner? We all have. They're, they're, what, the thing you don't understand is actually when you go to a charity dinner, there are two charity dinners going on at the same time. The first one was up here in front. See all these people with it, where there's all the light and they're all talking to one another and the cl glasses are clinking and everything. It's because they bought the table of 10. And they're drinking champagne and enjoying themselves. There in the back, where it's dark, back by the swinging door, back by the kitchen, there's a completely different event going on. And that's where the people only bought one or two tickets. And so for the Boston Public Library, and I think it was 2004, my wife and I had were, went to it because we were supporters of the library. And we're back there, back by that kitchen door, and we walk in walk into where the worthy events being held, and you could see the sense of doom that had already settled over the table. And what's happened is there are eight spaces already filled. We take the final two seats. And across from me, there is this guy. He has three sheets to the wind already, and he's working the table. He has his business card out in front of everybody. He is a wealth manager for Merrill Lynch, and which is another word for stockbroker. And he's telling everybody how I got 25% for my good customers last year. Okay, that's very good. Except over the course of the evening, he went to 30% and 35%. And by the end of the evening, he was getting 50% for his really good customers. And first I thought he was alone, but then I realized there was a woman next to him who just kept everyone's while doing this, calm it down, calm it down. I didn't think they were together because this guy is, he's, he's middle-aged already, and you know, he's got the 
got the belly and the double chin and everything else. And the woman sitting next to him is dressed so elegant. She's absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And, but there's a look on her face at the very beginning of the evening, which is sort of utter boredom. But over the course of the evening, the look on her face turns to one of concern, and then anger, and by the end of the evening, outright vitriolic hatred that this man sitting next to her is not only ruining her dinner tonight, but is ruining her entire life. So at the end of the evening, we escaped, and we're outside waiting for our car to be brought around, and I turned to Betty and I said, did you see what I saw tonight? No context at all for, the, for what she was, what I, what I had said. And she turns to me and she says, I thought she was going to kill him right then and there. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, we were thinking exactly the same thing. So I went home and I wrote two paragraphs. First paragraph said, you can call this a confession if you must, but last year I murdered my husband. I did it in cold blood with malice of forethought. Second paragraph. Now, let's not call this a confession, because that implies guilt or remorse. I don't feel the least bit guilty, and I certainly have no remorse. The bastard got what was coming to him. I knew their names. You know, I had never spoken with them at any point in time. I've never had exchanged words. I have no idea what their names were. The only time I had ever even heard them speak at any time was when the woman, whom I called Cat, and I called him George, just for, because they sounded like good names, Cat, there's a woman sitting next to Cat on this side who's trying to do anything in order to try and rescue the evening. And she turns to her and says, blah, 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 Wellesley. And Cat swings her head around and says, Wellesley Hills. I'm saying, wow. I mean, there's a lot of pent up anger in here. So I knew that, okay, you know, Cat's, you know, Cat's, if she lives in Wellesley Hills and, 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 he's, and he's in the financial industry. Okay. What's a pretty good start for a book? But you need something more. And so what I've discovered is that fiction is reality on steroids. Absolutely true. Anybody know this painting? One of the most iconic paintings of the 20th century. Saturday Evening Post who commissioned it for the May 29th, 1943 issue. And Norman Rockwell is supposed to paint the painting. So they want to paint Rosie the Riveter. So you would imagine probably the War Production Board went out to every factory in the country in order to find, look at this woman, look at it, look at that look of utter confidence on her face, look at the muscles on her, look at them, I mean, just, this is, a, this is a woman who knows that she's single-handedly going to win the war. Look what, she's, look what she's resting her feet on, a copy of Mein Kampf. How's that for having absolute confidence in who and what you are? And you figure, you went to every factory trying to find her, and you brought them in one at a time with Norman Rockwell saying, oh, that one's no, just up to, till finally finding is exactly the right one. That's not the case. This is the model for that woman. This is Mary Keith Doyle. Mary Keith Doyle was the telephone operator in Arlington, Vermont, two miles from where, it turns out, Norman Rockwell was spending the war years. And so all he did was bring her in, painted her, and then began using his imagination to come up with turning her into Rosie the Riveter. And so, wow. But once I knew that, I knew that for quite some time, and I was thinking, you know, let's go ahead and maybe what we need to do is we need to go back and revisit that event, and let's think about the people in it once more. So, George, stockbroker, that's not so good. So let's instead, let's turn him into a securities analyst. Better yet, let's turn him into a crooked securities analyst. And let's turn Cat into a person who is actually intent upon murdering him, preferably in such a way that, by the way, he's also cheating on her, preferably in such a way that she's gonna, that he is gonna die in his, in his mistress's bed, okay? This is really being vindictive about all this. Well, when you're starting to sit down and start writing, turns out, so you can't see it right down here, but it's here actually all the time. This is, this is my gym bag. I carry it with me at all times. It's Kelly Green, so I think you see the Nike swoosh. And when it comes time to write, I pick up the bag, and into it I have put all the conversations and interesting stuff that happens to me over the course of a week, and I turn it upside down, and I shake it out onto the table, and I go looking and pawing through it for the things that are going to be filling out the book. And so when I found out, one of the first things I found was an absolutely fascinating thing. It was an, it was, it was an occurrence that had happened to me just a couple of weeks earlier, where I'd been standing in line at the Medfield Post Office, and I'm waiting to go ahead and I'm waiting to mail a package, and there are two women in front of me who have their, who have their passport applications. And the one turned there, as you do in line, you're, you're reading one another's passport application, and the one's reading, and she looks at the other one, and she says, no way you're 5'9". The other woman turns to her and says, I am in my heels. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know nothing about shoes. 
it's obvious if you look at my feet that I know nothing at all about anything like this. And this was a complete revelation to me that those extra three inches out of all of that was going to be part of that. So, well, Kat's going to get arrested for her husband's murder. I'm going to tell you that right away. And so in the process of what happens is that what is really going to get her angry about that is the fact that when she gets booked for his murder, she's going to have to have her picture taken and it's going to show the world that she is only five feet six inches tall. And is she angry about getting arrested? Yeah, but is she, what is she really angry about? Having that photo taken and being flashed in newspapers all over New England over that. Second thing that happened along the way was that I was out shopping with Betty. We were out, we were out in Market Basket, the one out in Bellingham. And because Betty's doing the most of the shopping, I'm sort of just walking, I'm no, you know, noticing things that are going on. And there were two women who were in front of me who were talking and sort of shopping side by side with one another. And there was a really interesting conversation going on. Because it turns out one of the women is trying to counsel the other one over the fact that her son's girlfriend has announced that she is pregnant. And she is demanding that her son marry her. And so the son is sort of not interested in doing this quite all this time. And so what the one woman is counseling the other is says, you know, you know, you don't even know. It, it, it turns out they were, they were I, I was assuming the Portuguese was their native tongue, but, but, they were sort of, but they were speaking in English. And the one woman is telling the other, you know, you don't even know if that's his baby. You go ahead, you make that girl take a, take a DMV test. Now, I wanted to raise my hand and say, I'm sorry, I don't think you mean DMV test. I think you mean you say, but then I realized, no, I mean, for, for them, in their milieu for this, DMV test makes absolutely perfect sense. So what's going to happen is, Kat is going to, Kat, Kat is going to get arrested, she's going to get booked, she's going to be put in a holding cell, and the whole world already knows she's, that she is guilty because the DA has been investigating her for weeks or months, it seems like, and right in there in the holding cell is a woman who's going to counsel her the fact that the fact that, you know, again, the girlfriend, the, the mistress was in fact pregnant and has announced that she's entitled to half of the estate. And so what's going to happen is this woman in the cell is going to counsel Kat, says, you know, you don't trust that, you go ahead, you make her get one of those DMV tests. And so I just simply lifted a, lifted a piece of dialogue that I actually I had overheard and put it right there into the book. The third thing that is sort of interesting in all this is the fact that I was on the financial side of corporate stuff. Okay, and I worked with people in the investment banking industry for my entire career, and I know about hedge funds. I know more about hedge funds than anybody else on the face of the earth, and I had always wanted to explain hedge funds to an audience. And so I wrote a 5,000 word section of Murder and Perfect, which explained all about hedge funds. And I show it to Betty, Betty's sort of my first reader, and she says, you know, it's a little long. Okay, so I paired it back by a thousand words, and she stood and said, it's still really long. I took it back down to about a thousand words. She says, you're not getting the idea. People don't want to read this. Essay, but I want to explain. She says, well, then get it down to its essence. And so I thought about it I, for a couple of days. And finally, when I, was, when I finally had the finished manuscript, this is what I had said about manuscripts. Hedge funds are built around secrecy, run by men who were once boys who played with secret decoder rings. And you know what? That's a perfect explanation for a hedge fund. So the book came out, the book was a success, and it went ahead and got me to go ahead and start writing a whole bunch of other books. There are books that I had had in my mind. Um, you know, I get the first page, it was Candy's going to kill George, or she's going to get away with it, and that's what you don't know until the very end of the book. And it turns out, again, it was a success, people loved the book, but there were books that had been in my head which I had always wanted to write, and I had never, never quite around to getting the story. And one of them was the fact that I, there were some stories that sort of had stuck with me all the way through my, my, my adolescence. Um, turns out I grew, up, I grew up in Miami. I didn't just grow up in Miami. I grew up, this is my house. This is Miami International Airport. This is, this is 150 feet, okay, from here to Pan American's overhaul complex, which is where my father worked. Back then, people built houses right next to things and it was not considered day classe. But even better than that, right over here was Pan American's International Stewardess Academy. And every day, because they, were, because they were living about two blocks right over here, they would walk right down my street, and they would go ahead and pass my window, and I was the teenage boy out there with his tongue <laughs> hanging out the side of his mouth. And I always wanted to write about that. I always wanted to be able to go ahead and do something with that. And, it was, and so, I, so I wanted to invent a story that would make really good stuff out of all of this. And I also wanted to use a character who I knew very well. I wanted to use my sister as a character in the book. Beverly went off to college in 1961. Um, 
She spent three years, and when she did not get her MRS degree, she said, eh, well, I'm not going to do this. Hopped on a motorcycle, went off to California, where she spent the next 15 years sort of having this vagabond existence. She was a roadie for Bob Marley and the Whalers, a free spirit, and I would get postcards and letters from her from all over the world, and she really had a great thing. And so, and so she became the, the model for the character, main character in the book, Susan Delaney, stewardess, and who also you know, wants to meet Mr. Wright, but who's also having a great time being a stewardess. And so what's going to happen is that I had other things that I wanted to play into it as well. I used to be part of the, the, the semiconductor industry back during its, deck, during its great infancy. I wanted to talk about the Cold War. I'm setting this book back in 1967. And so what's going to happen is Susan Delaney is just going to deliver a, a, you know, a, mis, a, a misplaced briefcase or a suitcase to a person to a hotel in Miami Beach and find out the guy is taking the header off the seventh floor balcony. And so the next thing you know, she was in a cross-country chase and what may be in that suitcase may very well be the plans of the world's first microprocessor four years before Intel introduced theirs. And so it's a really great story. And when I sent it to my agent, my agent wrote back and said, do you realize that you have rewritten North by Northwest for the new generation? I said, what, do you have nothing in common? She says, no, it's too, it's, you know, what you have is you have this MacGuffin in there, you know, this, this, you know, this suitcase with a semiconductor, would maybe the plans for the semiconductor in there. But that's not the story. This is a story about two people on a cross-country chase falling in love. And it turns out, yeah, I'm absolutely perfectly content with that going along the way. Um, happy with that book as well. It's also one which has sold very well, and it's, it's dear to my heart because, again, I got a chance to use my sister in all of this. <sighs> I ran the Boston Flower and Garden Show, at least Massachusetts Horticulture Society's section of it, for three years. I got hoodwinked into it. Don't, 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 don't get me started on how that all happened. But I ran the show, and I got to know all about the Massachusetts Horticulture Society, which is in dire financial straits at the time, and about the process of running them. And it turns out that at one of the shows um, that I did, there was this thing going on where this is the, after the preview party, and I'm sitting around with the, with the crew, the grounds crew of MassHort, and we're all around one of these water features, and these guys hate the executive director of the organization. And they're talking about what a rat he is and how he's everything, cheating him every way. And they say, we're going to kill him. How would you do that? Drown him right here in one of these water features. <laughs> well, you can't do that because the place has guards around. Now, this, this, is back, this is back when the show was held down at Bayside. So, now, if this place has fallen apart, they don't take care of it. You know, this is, there's only one, there's one guard that comes around every 45 minutes. So as soon as that guard leaves, that's when we take care of him, just leave him there. Well, how are you going to make your getaway? The doors are all alarmed. No, there's a sign there again. They, they have so many, they have so many um, false alarms in this. It's 300 bucks every time it's a false alarm. They just turned off the alarms. You can just walk right out in there, walk in with absolutely no troubles. Wow. So pretty soon, I've got an idea. Guess what? We're going to murder off the executive director. <laughs> and so that's what we've got. This is what you call a Romana play, a true story with just enough face, you know, enough changed around it to where they can't sue you. Got a society that's functionally bankrupt, a string of executive directors, each one the worst than the last, a prestigious show that's actually been losing more than a million dollars every year in a decrepit facility, and they cast out very strong little characters, especially the landscape exhibitors and the trustees. So who murdered this guy? And so that's a, that's a, um, it's going to be the secret that you're not going to find out until all the, the clues are always, the, the clues are always sprinkled in there all the way through the way. But along the way, I needed a detective to investigate this. And so I came up with one, once again, from out of my past. Back in my investment banking days, I had worked on, on, on a road show with a young uh, Chinese American woman. She was born in Taiwan, brought to the U.S. when she was four. And she is you know, she's now a senior vice president for Goldman Sachs at the age of 30. And so when you are out there on a road show, you are all together. You are crammed into very tight quarters. You live one another's lives whether or not you want to or not. And so you get to ask questions. And I say, you know, your parents must be incredibly proud of you, you know, the fact that you've achieved this you know, at such a young age. And she looks at me and she says, I'm going to know you well enough to go ahead and tell you this. When I go see my parents, the first thing they ask is, which part of the medical school didn't you understand? <laughs> okay, I use that in the book. And the other thing is that you're, she has a boyfriend, and she has a boyfriend who is back in New York, who works for one of these funds, and he is the world's worst boyfriend. He is a guy who is saying, why aren't you, we're in Milan. He said, why aren't you here for dinner time? I'm in Milan. Well, why did you have to go? Why couldn't you send somebody else? 
The guy is you know, he's a baby, except that he's worth five million dollars, or something like that, because he's 32 years old. Why are you still here? He's Chinese. He's exactly what my parents expect me to bring home. I'm saying, wow. So he's in there that book very, very much as well. Um, a great story. I introduced a couple of other characters into it, which go into much greater things in time. But uh, Murder of the Flower Show is a really twisty, windy mystery, which also tells you everything there is to know about running a flower show. I had so much fun with that one that I wanted to go ahead and bring the characters back, so I brought them back for, uh, for murder in, in negative space. Negative space is a term in the world of, of, of art. Um, so what's going to happen here is that a prominent Russian floral designer is going to be found stabbed and hanged at a world floral design exhibition being held in Boston, which in fact did happen in Boston in 2011, and I got roped into working for it. And so I looked at it and said, this would be a great place for a murder. So what I did was I murdered off Vladimir Putin's favorite floral designer. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And so the question is, she's, she's a really obnoxious woman. But there's something else about her. She is the granddaughter of Marsha Zukov. Now, if you know anything about World War II history, Marsha Zukov was the man who saved Russia. He was the one who, be, who lifted the siege of Stalingrad and Leningrad. He chased the Wehrmacht all the way back to Berlin and accepted the German surrenders. And he was even the, the head of occupation for the Eastern Zone in the first years after, after the war. And so Marshal Zukov doesn't have a granddaughter. I certainly checked all that out. He had four daughters with no grandchildren who ever made it into any sort of thing. But this is his granddaughter, and she lives off the fact that she is her, she is Valentina Zukova, and she is the daughter, a granddaughter of the great Marshal Zukov. Bow down to me because of that. So all sorts of things, all sorts of history, can be figuring into this. But it's a it's a great book, and once again, telling a great story. And who who killed Valentina Zukova? You you can figure it out if you're really reading it carefully enough. But in the end, there's enough plot twist to keep you going away all the way. Those two books had a set of characters in them, which I really enjoyed. And I wanted to go ahead and bring this you know, back into a more suburban setting. So I took two minor characters in them. One of them was Liz, was Liz Phillips, who was the president of the Garden Club out in a fictional town called Hardington. And uh, she was a very minor character in, in Murder Negative Space and Murder the Flower Show. Now I bring her up to prominence. And now she is the person who is going to, be, who's going to find the body of her friend down at the bottom of the stairs. And, and it turns out that John Flynn, who is the, um, who is the detective who worked alongside uh, Victoria Lee in the other two books, is now retired, and he has come out to this quiet suburban town. And the idea that there's a murder on his watch in the first three weeks that he's there, absolutely impossible, because there haven't been any murders, murders in Hardington in 15 years. But she has to pull, drag him, kicking and screaming and understanding that this is going to be a, uh, that, this, that there in fact has been a murder here. And murder in worthy cause, once again, sets up the same, same thing, same thing taking place. The thing about the murder in the Garden Club is it gave me an opportunity to use all the stuff that Betty would come home and she would say, you would not believe what I heard today. And I would say, yes, I would say that and tell me all about it. So she told me all these stories. She tells me a story about a member of the Garden Club who has been, who everybody knows is submitting falsified receipts for geraniums in the site that she plants, you know, the little public park that she's, you know, the little wayside garden that she's responsible for. There are 12 geraniums in there, and so you can count the 12, and she has received, they're all, you know, $10 each, but you can clearly see those are the $2.20 Home Depot <laughs> geraniums, but she's got a receipt for them, we got to reimburse them for it, and we know darn good and well that they've been planted out at her summer home out in Mattapoisin. <laughs> and so, wow, I wonder if somebody could get murdered over something like that. Or the fact that Tresca Brothers, which was located right over the, right over the, the Charles River from Medfield, runs trucks all the way through the, time, through the town, and they frequently would simply run over sites. And there was one woman who had a site, particularly right in the corner of Hartford Street and 109, if you know that, beautiful site, where the Tresca Brothers trucks would just tear around, would just simply go over the first street into it. And once she got on her bicycle and she chased the truck <laughs> all the way back across the river into, into, into uh, Millis and went in and started yelling at them for doing this and made them promise they would never do it again. Of course, they just laughed her head. Would that have been the reason why this woman got murdered? Just maybe. Or maybe something as drugs, because the woman in the book has a son with a drug problem, and we once had a set of neighbors, and we lived down in Virginia, who very much had a son who was, who was opioid dependent, and 
there were times when he thought he was simply waiting in order to get his inheritance from him. Might he have decided to go ahead and advance his inheritance in this? So it's, it, it's, you know, it's one of these things in all of this, but the stories are only lightly fictionalized from all the things I heard along the way, and once again, you don't know until the last few pages because you've got all these different possibilities out there working. And it's going to take the Garden Club president plus the detective, each one working their own side of this in order to make it into a, into a solution. Um, murder for a worthy cause uh, also took place in, in Medfield. You may remember back in 2005, Extreme Makeover Home Edition came to town, and they put up a house for a needy family in a week. Along with everybody else in town, I worked on it. And it was, a, you know, it, was, it was a wonderful thing, except what you realized somewhere along the way was the fact that we were simply what you call B-roll. We were there in the background because we were all supposed to wave at the right point. We, most of us didn't have anything to do. But what I did get was this wonderful opportunity to get to see, observe the people, particularly the principals of Extreme Makeover Home Edition and the way they interacted with one another. And I thought that would make a really, really good story. That would come along really, really well. And so, I thought it'd be a great place for a murder. So I murdered, all, so I murdered a, a Hardington town selectman who's found dead in the opening pages of the book. And what you do not know all the way through the book is, was he doing something bad that he got killed for, or was he in the wrong place at the wrong time? So a lot of fun in all of that. Um, the lead character in that, in both of those books, is Liz Phillips. And people always ask me, gee, Liz Phillips, you know, I wonder, is there any, is there any, you know, anything between her and Betty? And what I answer them is the fact they are both very strong, independent women. They're absolutely wonderful, and she's, you know, but that's, no, the, the, the similarity is there. And if I said otherwise, she would kill me. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> also very early on, I came up with the idea for the Garden Club Gang. That was a, a book where, um, um, when I was here, I, I think I talk about it at, 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 at some length. Um, the idea is that it's going to be four women of a certain age who are each having a very ex an existential um, life, things going on in their life, crises. One of them has just discovered a recurrence of breast cancer. One of them has a husband who is, she has had to go into the facility because of Alzheimer's. One has simply outlived her savings and she's slowly slipping into poverty. And the fourth one is... Um, her husband died, and uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to her. What she discovered was that after she discovered him dead, she waited an hour to call the, to call the paramedics because she wanted to make certain there weren't going to be any miraculous resuscitations. <laughs> so they're going to get together, and they're going to not. And so you know, what happens is there's, you know, the, 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 the event that comes out of that is, is when uh, Betty came home and told me about a member of the group who had stolen a dollar and 98 cents worth of prints from a drugstore when the, when, the, when the two attendants at the desk would not pay attention to her. And, and I took her out to lunch and she said, I'm invisible. And when she said, I'm invisible, it sort of made me realize that women of a certain age become invisible and that they can use it to their advantage. And these four women, to get together, what they're going to do is they're going to use it to knock over the Topsfield Fair. They're going to rob the fair's daily gate. And it's going to be an absolutely terrific, perfect crime committed in broad daylight on a Sunday afternoon with just a couple of teensy-weensy problems, the first one of which is that they had to commit it on a Sunday in broad daylight on an, in August. And it's the slowest news day of the slowest news month of the year. And so instead of being two paragraphs in the Globe and no mention of any television, it's all over media, all over New England, because it's the only interesting thing that happened on that particular Sunday afternoon. And so every law enforcement agency in the state is looking for them. The second thing maybe wasn't so teensy is the fact they thought they'd get about $125,000. The fair officials say they got $128,400, and the problem is sitting in the attic, they have half a million dollars. Somebody's lying, and why are they lying? And by any chance, is there anybody else out there who's looking for that money as well as for them? Great story, absolutely wonderful, and you, you get to know the four ladies. And immediately, as soon as that book came out, everybody starts saying, Write me another one. Tell me what to go about more about them. And they say, fine. It took me four years to come up with it. And what happened was, was that a member of the Medfield Garden Club died. We went to, we went to her wake, which was being held in one of these very upscale nursing homes. And there are men standing around in coats and ties who obviously aren't there morning and sit there talking about her. And they're talking about her finances and her role in this. And I'm saying, yeah, that's, first of all, it's kind of tacky. But also I'm saying, wow, this gets me interested in the fact that you know, all these things that go on with the elderly. 
And so you hear things like the fact that, you know, all these radio ads, you know, the nursing home wants your money. What are those asset protection things really about? Are they really as upfront as you think they are? Or are there something more behind it? And also along the way that there was going to be all the things in there because we were in the process of buying a car at the time, and I hate automobile dealers, so we're also going to go ahead and we're going to have the ladies are going to take down a, a very well-known auto dealer who's been doing a lot of crooked things, except what's going to happen is while they're trying to solve the murder of a friend of theirs in this nursing home, they've also got the people from the, from the car dealer's uh, network who has also decided they want to get revenge upon them. I didn't explain that very well. Very funny. Yeah, you're agreeing with me. Okay. All right. I'll go back and I'll work on that. Talk, remember, I gotta get out of here at eight o'clock because at eight o five, first pitch. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Okay. So that book came out. Everybody loved it. And all of a sudden, once everybody said, "Hey, we well, need to go ahead and get another one. Now you gotta do all this." And by the way, can you have it out by Christmas? No, I can't. It took three more years in order to go ahead and write something in there, and I could not come up with a plot for the life of me. And so I'm just sort of stomping around the house, and I'm just gonna disappear up and. And the thing you have to understand about me is that when I'm really frustrated and such, I go up to cable channel 456, you know, where you've got all of the old situation comedies back when things were really funny. And I'm sitting back there and I'm watching those. And so because, you know, it sort of appeals to a certain people of a certain age, well, you see some really strange commercials in there. You know, you've got, got you know, Magnum PI out there saying, you, know, you need a reverse mortgage. It's fascinating. Go back to the show, the next thing you know, now you got the Fonz up there saying, you need a reverse mortgage. Okay, well, maybe you're trying to tell me something. Back to the show, and then one more time comes out there, and you know, here's Robert Wagner saying, you need a reverse mortgage. I said, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll take a reverse mortgage as soon as you tell me what happened to Natalie Wood. Okay? And so, we <laughs> come in one more time, and one of the other guy from, you know, from Law and Order you know, is out there, he's up there, you need a reverse mortgage. And I'm saying, you know, Maybe there's a story in there somewhere along the way. So I started investigating reverse mortgage, and the next thing I know, I say, I did not know a darn thing about it. I knew absolutely nothing about it. But then when I started investigating, I found it, it is this enormous cesspool out there because it turns out there are two different kinds of reverse mortgages. One of them is controlled by very strict control, so the, you know, the, the, the senior has every much in control and can bow out of any time. All sorts of oversight, all sorts of you know, doors where you can escape from it. And then there's this other kind of this sleazy thing where you know, basically it's this whole fly-by-night operation. And the trouble is nobody wants to issue the good ones because you can't make any money on them. So you end up going over to this guy over in here. And so when I started thinking about this idea that there you know, a sleazy organization, what would happen if you had one whose sole purpose in existence was to go in and to try and basically make you default on that mortgage just as quickly as possible and steal the house out from under you. Well, I invented Senior Equity Living System Solutions, and so they, in turn, they're going to be the ones who are going to go ahead, and the Garden Club gang is going to get back together, and they're going to take down this place, and the problem is they've got to get up close to them. And what they do is they need to be able to be in the same office building that they're in, so what they're going to do is they're going to set up a business, which is going to be sort of supposed to be, uh -huh, importing these Provencal fine table items, which we had sitting in our house, and I'd been staring at them for years, and I never thought that there was a plot point in there, but they were there all the time, and I said, okay, fine, and so that's what they're gonna do is, but the problem is, is, is that in order to make it seem real, they had to have a website, and they had a friend who was a really good web designer, it's because they knew that these guys would immediately check them out to make sure that they were real, and the next problem is that the web designer did way too good of a job, because while this is just supposed to be a business on paper, all of a sudden, they've got orders coming in through the door, and they've got to start fulfilling them, otherwise the guys over there are going to start figuring out that's just a front for them to be able to nose around in their business. And so you've got two, a couple of very serious things going here, but you've got a great little bit of you know, comic relief going in there as well as they come to, come to terms with the fact that they are going to be successful despite it all. And that book became Fatal Equity, which is my latest book and all of that. And the thing I'd like to say about all the Garden Club gang books is the fact there was one other person that I had always wanted to include in them, and that was my Aunt Virginia. And so Aunt Virginia is a character in this book. I won't tell you which one, but she is, um, she was very good to me uh, all those summers that I was there. She would take me places and talk to me about bunches of things and gave me great books to read. And so this is sort of my way of saying thanks to her for that. Um, when you have a set of characters that are really working well for you, you want to keep working with them. But sometimes you come to a point where you're trying to write a story and you don't, and you just find out that the existing characters just don't work for you. The, the good thing, the existing characters 
readers love catching up with them. They, it's an opportunity you can promote right a second, like I did with Liz Phillips. They're easier to write, frankly, because people already know their background, you know, they, they're used to what they're doing, they, they want to find out what they're doing next. And the chief problem is that they bring along baggage. They have backgrounds which your reader already knows about, and they have friends, you know, why is this friend in it? Why is who would this new friend come out of there? The alternative is to invent a new lead character. No messy background, you can go ahead and you can, you can you know, do it to order. And um, it's terrific, but it's harder to write. Now, the chief problem is you don't have a built-in audience for the book. Instead, you've got to actually build, and build a readership for this by saying, I know it's a set of new characters, but you're really gonna love the book. Well, I had to do that because I wrote a book called How to Murder Your Contractor. It is a memoir, okay? Everything in that book, almost everything in that book, happened to us when we were building our dream retirement house three years ago. And so, because I had to have a character in here, I had to have, I, I knew this was gonna be narrated by, you know, by, a, by my lead character, and I knew what her name was, it was Anne Evans Carlton. I knew all about her, I knew her age and everything else. None of my existing characters fit, so I had to invent Anne Evans Carlton, and I incorporated all these very stories and you know, stories of how we're doing it. Soon, I had the title for the book long before I had even started writing it. Every time I would say, I'm writing a book called How to Know Your Contractor, everybody would tell me, you know, <laughs> wow, let me tell you my story and all of this. And so, none of my stock characters fit the plot, so, I invented Anne. Anne is a five-day winner on Jeopardy, back in the 1990s. Yep, she's 48 years old, she's an empty nester, which is kind of interesting. Most, you know, most people now delay having kids until into their 30s, so how can she already have kids who are out of college? And she also, um, she's a master gardener, and she has a lot of master gardener friends, and she was also a national uh, show jumping champion uh, in the horse ring back when she was a teenager. So a great set of credentials, and what allowed me to do was to build a new set of friends for her, all of whom are gonna help her deal with this contractor. And so, um, and I hope I can use her again because I very much enjoy being around her. She is a lot of fun. And the problem is everybody automatically assumes you know, that, that Betty is the, is the model for Anne, even though clearly she isn't. Well, they're both master gardeners. And Betty's had to explain to people, I have never appeared on Jeopardy. I was never a five-day winner. Please get that out of your head. No, I didn't. But what year was it? I wanna see if I can catch it up. Is there a YouTube video of it? I've been in trouble for that one ever since. <laughs> oh, she's so smart. She could have been. I'm sorry? She's so smart. She easily could have been. She definitely could have, and we tend to be Jeopardy watchers, and she's the one who knows all the answers. I mean, she's, she can run the board every single night. Um, last book I want to talk to you about is, is uh, next to the last one, is um, with a new set of characters, and it is that two years ago, I got given a copy of a book called Lab Girl by Hope Jaren, and it, it's a memoir of her becoming a research scientist I read that book and I was just, I absolutely loved it. And the neat thing about it was that it told me things that I did not know. The fact that you know, scientists could be a protagonist in a story, a scientists could also be a best writing, be, write a bestseller. And I also learned all about pheromones. Guys do not know about pheromones. What happens is, in junior high school, okay, the boys go off and they take shop, and the girls get taken over here and they get taught all about pheromones. Okay? So we don't learn about them until we have to read books like this. But this came out to be a great story, and I had a lot of stuff in that, you know, that bag of mine, so I, I turn over you know, my, my bag and I pull that over the table and look at this stuff. I mean, why people seek revenge? Biotech startups? Why, did, why does my cat keep scratching my furniture? The plight of all these untamed interns, management, all, I had all these ideas that I wanted to put into a book, and so I managed to go ahead and put them all into it. But in order to do it, first I had to have another character. And so I came up with Brian LaPointe. Brian LaPointe is the head of a story New England organization called New England Green. He is a PhD horticulturalist. He has seen, he is in, he has been escorting around a billionaire philanthropist, one of these women who have decided they're going to give away their complete billion dollar fortune, did all the, you know, the, the giving pledge, and extremely charming, can charm people out of into giving money to the organization all the time. Brian has a couple of character flaws, though. First of all, he's been stealing New England blind for the past 18 years. He does not have that PhD in horticulture that he claims. He walked down in his family in order to take up with this young billionaire, and he lies. In fact, every time he opens his mouth, you ought to assume he's lying. Well, he's going to get taken down. He's going to take it down by six strong, independent women. Penny Walden is the person who wrote that bestseller back when she was in college. She's now a research scientist and is trying to get away from that, but she's going to get recruited into this. Ali LaPointe is Brian LaPointe's daughter, who has sworn revenge on him for the past four years. Helga Johansson is his ex-wife, 
who has been repressing the rage that she feels over this for the past four years. Emily Taylor Rice is the aforementioned billionaire who is dying and finding out some things about the woman, about the man whom she has decided she's going, he's going, she's going, she is going to marry. And Tyler Malone and Zoe Matthews are a pair of interns who are going to get roped into all of this in order to go and help bring him down. Oh, one other thing is going to be in order to do make this all work. There's also going to be a cast of several hundred cats involved with this, and the cats are going to be absolutely essential to making it all work. Um, last book that I'll talk about is, is because of this one, this is number 12, is Deal Killer. People always say, you know, I have, so, I have finance that runs through so many of my books. People say, you really ought to write a financial thriller. I did. I wrote it 10 years ago. Nobody bought it. This is my one failure of a book along the way. Everybody really said, wow, this is really good. You know, I never heard about it. He said, the problem is, never, never got any reviews, never got any of this because, well, it was so, you know, because everybody thinks I wrote, I write other stuff. But in this case, what I did was, what I, I had worked on mergers and acquisition, you know, again, for two decades in all of this. And the real work, you know, when you see it in movies and such, and it's being done at 50,000 feet in a private jet flying over, you know, flying to Gaston or something like that. In real life, it's being done by what you call deal grunts who are working in close quarters and they're trying to put together, you know, put together this merger. And so they've got three years to prove themselves because for three years, if they're making so much money that if they are not now bringing in money, you're out of there. So I worked with a couple of those people along the way. And Len Kowalczuk, uh, who is the, who's the protagonist in Deal Killer, is an amalgam of several of the women whom I worked along the way. And they are incredibly talented, incredibly knowledgeable, and they're in such incredible pressure. And I thought it would be really good if what would happen would be that this woman is going to find out that there is a somebody on the management side of this deal has found a way to try and get a couple of million dollars out of it as sort of a private <coughs> parachute, private you know, golden parachute. And she's the only person who can figure it out, this, the, the man inside the company feels like. And so he's got to get rid of her, and she's got to find out what it is before he succeeds. Um, good taught story, once again. Everybody who reads it loves it, because nobody ever read it. So I'm left with this, this notion that you know, maybe I was destined to become a writer. Maybe it was going to happen one way or another in the 35 years that I spent out in the corporate world was just a detour, but I don't think so. I think that that's where I came up with all my really, really great ideas. Without the background, without the history, I could never have written about that. I certainly would never have been able to write about strong, independent women. So, thank you. It's been a wonderful audience. Thank you for answering questions along the way. And it's five minutes of eight, so nobody's going to miss the opening pitch. And <laughs> I have never sped through this presentation as quickly as I have. Does anyone have any questions along the way? <coughs> yes. Leo, did you ever go to any writing workshops or um, anything any, to learn how to be a writer? Okay. Um, I did write fiction of a sort. I used to write five year business plans. <laughs> uh, and the answer is no. I, I, had, uh, I, had, I had actually written a a, you know, a novel like book of fiction um, right after my mother died in 1988. It was sort of my cathartic way of dealing with her death. And when I was finished with it, it was 120,000 words long. It was absolute utter dreck. Um, I wrapped it in chains with multiple locks on it. And I dropped it off a boat and I was sitting down at the bottom of the ocean where it will never be seen again because it was horrible. But I had the experience of being able to find out this is what you have to do in order to put one sentence behind another, to have a plot that actually has a plot arc and everything works in with it. And um, uh, I tried going to a writer's group at one point, and I ended up sitting around a table at a Barnes & Noble with eight women, all of them between the ages of 22 and 28, who were all writing the same book. Some of it was fiction, some was nonfiction, but it was all about you know, their, 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 their bastard of either a boyfriend, father, husband, or something else. And, you know, and their, their angst of trying to deal with this person, their anger, and they were writing about this, and I was a guy sitting in this circle, and I was being looked at like I was the enemy, and so I said, I think this is probably not for me. I went, I went to two sessions of it, and then sort of dropped out. But, and so apart from that, um, I simply read everything I get my hands on. I have a circle of people who read my stuff, you know, not to say well, how great it is, but to tell me everything that's wrong with it. And they are the people who get the credit for, um, making the whole thing work. How yes. did you happen to come up with a, how did you get an agent? I mean, you, you basically, you didn't seem to have 
a base where you could find somebody because that didn't seem to be what your background was in. I queried, I queried a lot of people. I had a, I had written, you know, I'd read all of that, how you write a good pitch letter, how you get you know, that first, you know, that, that terse summary of it, those first couple of pages are gonna grab you. Mm -hmm. And Murder and Perfect has a really great hook right up front and it's got a great story, which is not one we did been frequently. So yeah, I ended up with an agent. Um, I'm with two offers of, of agency right in there. Now, here's the problem. They never sold the book. Okay. They did not, no. And the, and the problem was that it, it's 2005, 2006, 2007. The, 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 no, not the economy, it's Amazon. And the publishing industry, which had been following this wonderful straight course, you know, a giant boat just steaming through the waters, you know, can, and they could afford to take on somebody, you know, they know they're gonna sell five or 10,000 copies of the first book, it's the second one that's gonna get it, and they're gonna help build the readership. Instead, what they're saying is, who is Neil Sanders? Who is, who is, who is gonna buy his book automatically? And um, I couldn't answer that question. So as a result, they sent back, I mean, usually when you get a rejection letter from a publisher, it's like two paragraphs. We've received your manuscript. It isn't right you know, for our needs at the current time. We wish you good luck with it. My agent would get back three and four page letters talking about the plot, talking about the characters, and everything, and if at the end of it, still coming back and saying, you know, we wish that this weren't going on in the world, but we can't afford to take on an unknown writer at this time. Mm -hmm. And so my thought was that, okay, you know, I'll self-publish, and you know, when like Fifty Shades of Grey, I thought, you know, 10 million copies of it on, you know, a self-published book, then they'll want, you know, they'll want to come after me. Um, I don't want to do that, it turns out. I want my life to be my own. I don't want to have to do, th I don't want to have to write things that I don't want to write. Mm -hmm. I want to write at my own schedule. And it turns out I do have a worldwide readership because the one thing that Amazon has done is all writers are created equal. And people find my books, you know, I sell books in Australia. I've never, I've, I've been to Australia 30 years ago, but I've got, I'm selling continuing stream, particularly of a murder in the garden club there. And I've never quite figured out why. No one's ever, I get emails from people all the time, you know, telling me because my name is, you know, my, and there's an email address on, on the first few pages of the book. And they say, you know, I loved your book, you know, and I live in England. And by the way, we have a garden club and we're reading your book as a group. And here, and, it, and, it, and it's so lovely of you. And if you're ever in England, please come visit us. But Australia, I have no idea how that happened. But I, you know, and so, and so I, I can convert Japanese yen, I can convert um, pounds, euros, and everything else because I'm selling all these things, particularly Kindle. Kindle gives you an automatic platform all around the world. So it turns out, I don't, I don't. You didn't need an agent. Well, yeah, the agent, the agent gave up after two books and said, you know, I wish I could help you, but. Unfortunately, you know, just, they just aren't going to buy it. So, and that's that's when I started self-publishing, and certainly has worked out really well for me. I'm happy. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Okay. Go home. It's eight o'clock. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.